Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, guys. Thanks to the worship team. What a sweet way to start the year together, huh? Yeah. So I do want to pray uh, before we get going this morning. I, I just want to tell you, though, um, Happy New Year. Buckle up. We're in for a, went for a ride this year. Yeah, it's going to be good. Just slap your neighbor and say, it's going to be good. Maybe I just wake them up, too. Slap your neighbor. It's going to be, it's going to be good. So uh, let's just pray as we, as we kick off this morning. Welcome. If you're a guest with us, we're just happy you're with us this morning. Um, we consider this our time of family gathering, so we're real intentional about how we do church together because we believe the body is the church. Church is an organism. It's not an organization. Jesus said in his scripture, I will build my church, and um, that was the ecclesia. That was the movement, a movement of people on purpose. That's who you are. And if you've chosen to be family like in here in this gathering, you're not going to be comfortable for long because what we've said is we don't want members. We want people that will partner with the mission of God. The mission of God to reveal his son, to be a revelation to people, to represent Jesus Christ on this earth. And that applies to you every day, everywhere that you go. So, buckle up. It's going to be good. Let's pray, Jesus. Thank you. Father, we thank you that you are um, good. Lord, I thank you that even as we declare those songs, God, I thank you for the truth, the simple truth, God, that most people never get is that you're good. God, I thank you for your goodness as a father. Lord, I thank you that it's your goodness and your kindness that leads us to change. God, I thank you that goodness and mercy follow us, God, all of our life. Jesus, I thank you there will never be a day, God, that I'll pay for what your son paid for my life. I thank you that you took it upon yourself. God, I thank you for, um, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for the reality that's true, God, that I stand before you, God, white, robed in righteousness because of you. I thank you that mine was like filthy rags. And God, I got to trade. Lord, I got to trade. So Lord, as we start this year, Lord, we, we give thanks. Lord, we do what? God, what we know to do, we give you thanks, God. We give you thanks for all the times, Lord, that we know of, God, all the times that we, we weren't even aware, God, of your goodness and your covering over us. Lord, I thank you that it's simple for those that are far off, God. It's just turning it around. God, for those that are here today, Lord, that have been pushing, that have been fighting against you, God, I thank you that it's easy, Lord. It's easy to turn to you, God, to return back to the place that you established for us to be, God, just your kids. And so, Lord, I thank you for that simplicity, God, of your gospel. And, Lord, let it just reign and rule, God, in this river valley. God, let the good news spread. Lord, let it, let it wash, Lord, upon every house. Lord, let it come upon, Lord, the people that live, Lord, in this area that you've called us to. I thank you for a church that is for the city, God, that won't hold up in four walls, God, but that will choose to obey your great commission. So, Lord, I thank you for your presence being with us today. I thank you for your promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you get done before I do this morning, you can go ahead and go. But we got a few things we want to talk about this morning. I do want to say we are starting our 21 days of prayer and fasting begins tomorrow, and we're going 21 days all the way through uh, the, what is it, the, be the 26th? What does that mean? That's right, the 26th, which is a Monday. So if you're new with us or you haven't participated in any form of fasting, we don't do this like a religious activity. It's not something we just say, hey, look at us. We want to be careful to obey, just like Jesus said. We don't do it uh, just as a model to display to people. But it is prayer and fasting. I want you to remember it is those two things together. We were talking as a team this morning. And it's not a, it's not a place that we resign to. It's that we pray. We don't just remove something from us. We fill, we fill it with prayer. Fasting is amazing because it, you know, it's one of those things that reminds you and shows you, is there any area of my life that's not under the lordship of Jesus? And it never fails when I ask God, is there something, God, you want me to give up for this 21 days where my flesh just wants to show up? But listen, if we are to be led by the Spirit, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons, those are the children of God. And so the Holy Spirit will lead you, and he, will, he, will, he is good to show us, is there something that has taken the place of his lordship? So if I can't say he has access to everything, then he's technically not Lord, Correct. 
because uh, he is Lord of all. So fasting just looks like for us, we're going to set aside the 21 days. It's like Daniel did. If you want to read about his fast, people even do that from a health standpoint of just vegetables, juices. There's a hundred and hosts of ways you can do it. Don't, what I'm telling you is don't get caught up in the religious act of it. It's to connect your heart to God. It's to set aside the first. We always give God our first. That's the principle all throughout Scripture is we bring God our first. Who did he send? He sent his firstborn. He sent us his best. He sent us his first. That's what the 21 days is for. So listen, I want to see that prayer house just, I want to see it, I want to see it full for 21 days where we're just publicly, privately journaling, reading, praying, connecting with your heart to God. Listen, if you haven't gone out, if you haven't set aside some time just to pray, I encourage you, just go out to the prayer house and sit for a minute and tell me if you can recognize the presence of the Lord. There's something so sweet because people have been in that environment praying. It's a sweet space just to come. It's not to be on your phone. It's not to hang out with your buddies. It's to connect with God. It is what we would consider this is a holy, sacred place that we've dedicated to the Lord. When we open that prayer house, we sit in there as elders and pray, God, let your kingdom come. Let people connect to your heart in this place. Amen? So I just want to encourage you, if you haven't gotten in there, do it. So 21 days will start. We'll finish that up with a 24-hour part. What's cool is, is we'll talk in the next couple of weeks about some things we're seeing for the next year, but one of them is just around the area of prayer, how we connect to God. And so it may be hard for you to say, well, to pray an hour may seem foreign. Well, listen, if you start with about five minutes... It'll probably lead to another five minutes at some point, and the next day it'll probably lead to five more minutes. And prayer is, is connecting. I keep saying it, it's connecting with God's heart. It's not just me talking, it's me listening. It's me tuning my heart, softening my heart towards Him, towards the things that He cares about. And so when we pray, we've actually said, as a group of pastors that meets together in this river valley, we've agreed that every third Sunday, we would highlight to folks that we are praying for this city. So what I want to tell you is, in the River Valley, capture this thought for a second, is that we're starting to get where we understand we've got to pray for more than what's inside four walls on one hour of one day a week. We have to be engaged in prayer, put ourselves in the place of prayer for our city. Think about this. That represents about 6,000 people. What happens when 6,000 people agree for an area one time in, in a month? And what happens if that begins to increase? To me, it feels like a big tsunami of God's presence just coming across. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer we're agreeing with that's been prayed for thousands of years at this point. Come on, that's the prayer. That's the heart. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to need a little more feedback, or we're going to go probably to like 1.30 or 2. And I'm just going to shorten every time somebody shouts and says hallelujah, don't do it right now. That just feels manipulative. (laughs) So pull up Joshua 1. Let's talk this morning. So the year is 2020. Get a load of that. Saw the other day somebody posted, if you're born in 2020, when you're 80, you're going to see the year 3000. Is that not crazy? I don't even understand that. I mean, it just wasn't that long ago that Back to the Future, you know, we were just zipping through some years that have already passed now. Flux capacitor. Well, that was fake news that I was reading somewhere there. I was told that there would be no math with this job. You trust, I mean... Ben Franklin posted it on Facebook. It's got to be true, right? (laughs) See, now you're there. Thanks for listening. I was just checking to make sure you guys got it right. (laughs) Quick, somebody read some scripture. I will be looking for a new job next week. I hear the Cowboys have an opening. Mm. Hey, maybe. Hey, you never know. I like winning. It's their time. It's going to come back. It's their time. It's going to be winning. I am here today because um, you do want to process disappointment with people together. You don't want to be isolated, and the Patriots did lose last night. So part of my reasoning for being here today is I want to process pain and disappointment with people that I love. So the year is 2020. Let's just reel it back in. I've lost it. It's gone. 2020. 
So I've just been praying uh, for the last few weeks. The Lord, and I encourage you to do this for yourself. I, I feel like it's always good. The Lord always gives me just a word for the year. And I think he will for you too. So I think there are private things that he gives you just for your own heart to know, whether it be courage or whether it be patience or whether you pick it, whatever God says, okay, I'm going to develop something in you this year. It's less about what we're going to do and more about who we're going to become. I think that's the right way to look at it. And so um, I've just been praying, like, God, what is it for us corporately that you want to say? And I want to tell you what I feel like the wor- what the word is, and you're going to be like, yeah, but then I want to explain what that looks like. So every time I've prayed, it's just weird. It's one of those that I have literally seen the word, and the word is victory. Every single time I pray, and I'm like, well, Lord, I know, like, you lead us in triumph. That scripture is real clear. Like, you lead us, in, you lead us in that. And I felt like the challenge was, there, there's some challenge with it, but there's also when we get to the end of this year, if we face down some of the things we're called to face down, there's going to be a lot of winning. There's just going to be a lot of winning. So I want to explain to you this morning what I feel like that means for us as a family and what that looks like. Are you guys good with it? So open up your Bibles, Joshua chapter 1. Let's talk. It feels good to be back up here. The elders were super gracious. You know, I talked to you guys on Christmas, but... Super gracious to give. I felt like just during December needed to have a break of time with the family. I knew it last year. I came up into that time and I felt tired. And so just want to say thank you to our elders and to our leadership. They stepped in all through that month. And man, it feels good to be on team. It feels good to be around people that you love that, you, you know, I'm just as happy to listen to any of those guys or gals preach as I am, speak to you. But it feels good to be back, like in this space with you. I just want to tell you that as a family. Joshua 1, here we go. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Come on. You know, it's amazing the similarity of this commission that God gave Joshua to the one Jesus gave us. Uh, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, so I give it to you. Now go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey and observe everything I have commanded you to obey. And I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the very uttermost part of the earth. Sound familiar? Listen, we may not be great at it, but we're going to do it. We may not see it happen every time, we may not see a winter event, but it does not remove the mandate that we have, and we have as a family that we've said, yes, we will see this great commission be fulfilled. We will do what we're called to do, and to do that, it's going to require some courage. So in this scripture, you know, anytime, anytime you see God repeat something three times, you know that is him setting that thing in place. Multiple times throughout Scripture, when he says it, and he says it three times, remember when he comes to Peter, for example, Peter denies Christ. What's he say to him whenever he's healing Peter's heart back again? He's, he's coming back to him, and three times Jesus is just loving him. Boom, 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 healing the hurt, just solidifying, making something solid within him. He says in this Scripture, okay, um, you're going to need some things. And he says it three times, not only just be strong, but be courageous. Oh, no, also be strong and very courageous. Oh, now, be strong and be courageous. Well, listen, um, that sounds great from a distance. But it's not so fun when you're right in the middle of it, is it? 
So to see victory, just follow this. To see win, to see God, to, to see this commission fulfilled where we go, we see lives changed, we see places transformed. That's who we are. We said we're going to be about the presence of God, changing people's lives and transforming the places we go. That's the call. That was the commission. Well, listen, to do that, it requires courage. Why does it require courage? Because it's going to feel risky and you're going to face down fear. I don't care if that's individually, personally, in our own life. I heard it said like this. I heard it said like this not long ago when I was listening to a message. It takes courage and you cannot, you cannot conquer anything you're not willing to confront. You cannot. And so I, when I heard the word, it's like it went in my heart and I felt like I'm, I'm saying, God, is there compromise? And it, personally, God, is there anything that I'm not saying yes to, that I'm not giving you permission to say, yep, that's got to go away. Yeah, you can keep that. No, stop doing that. No, I don't want to see that change. If I'm unwilling to confront it, I don't care if it's patterns, if it's addictions, if it's processes, if it's people in our life, if we're not willing to confront the issue in front of us, we will never overcome it. We will never conquer it. And is there going to be fear? Uh, yeah, uh, but God didn't give us that. No, you have a spirit of power within you. But let me tell you, you're not going to be fearless. It will taunt. The, the voices will come. This is why God's promise is in here to Joshua. It was the same to Moses. It was the same Jesus gave us. Here's what I'm going to give you guys. I will never leave you. I will always be present with you. So the challenge is, can I recognize his presence? The challenge is, can I recognize him in the middle of whatever it is that I'm facing down? Can I recognize God? And he teaches Joshua to do this, and I think it's probably a good pattern. He says, I want you to meditate on my law day and night. I want you to look at my word. Well, what was the word? Joshua, the Bible hadn't been written. What was he telling him to rehearse? He was telling him to rehearse all the acts, all the things, all of, all of the miracles that happened. He gave him commands, do this and you will prosper. Do this, you will be blessed, like to stay under my covering, do these things. And he's telling Joshua, just stay in that. Be careful to meditate day and night. Put that on your lips. Let that be the filter that you look at things through. So if we're going to win, if we're going to confront the things that are, I don't care, again, if it's personal, they're like, hey, I just have not been willing to face that and deal with that. That's the scripture says, let's throw off the sin that so easily entangles, Right? So there's a point that comes that has to say, you have to get bold about it and say, I'm going to deal with this. I don't care if it's generational. I don't care if it's in my dad, if it was in my grandfather, if it's in my great-grandfather. I'm going to find some people that I love and trust, and we're going, to, we're going to face this thing head on. And we're going to see to it that this does not affect my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandchildren. Someone has to make a stand somewhere. Victory requires courage, and courage feels risky. It feels risky. And I'm telling you, the word for us for the years, we're going to take more risk. You can't win if you don't take some risk. Listen, I like offense. I don't like watching games where you're just sitting there and the score is three nothing. I want to see I want to see somebody score. It's the truth. Well, it's risky. I'm just telling you, the, the word for us to see those things happen for the year is going to be a risk. We're going to talk about some of the practical things that we feel called to do, but let me tell you the overarching picture of that is we have to get outside of ourselves. We have to take risk. To follow Jesus is to follow the way of faith, and the way of faith says, I'm going to trust the things that I can't see more than the things that I physically can see. That's what it looks like to be a people of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. I want, to be those, I want to be that people. When Jesus arrives, he says, will I find what on the earth? Will I find faith? Will I find some people that are believers? For crying out loud, that's what we're called. We're called believers for a reason. But to stare it down, to have a wind, to say, man, I look back. So when I look back at my own last year, I'm like, yeah, I dealt with that several times along the way. I don't want to deal with that. When I come to the end of 2020, I want to have victory over that. So God, I've got to bring that before you, which means I need some people around me to be accountable. They can say, hey, no, you're better than that. You're more than that. That's what accountability is. It's going to call you up higher. If those people are pushing you down in the dirt, that's condemnation. That's not the people, that's not the voice of God. You with me? 
To have victory, it's going to require risk. Risk is going to be able to face some things that makes me a little uneasy. Maybe he's called you to speak, and it scares you to death. Find somewhere to publicly speak. You're going to have to take risk. We're going to have to take risk. And we're going to have to be okay with a culture that just takes risk. Didn't seem to bother God too much. He entrusted this co-mission with us. That feels risky. He could have done it any way he chose fit. He was God. He chose to co-labor with us. Is that not, that's amazing. That he would put himself, his own heart, that he would be vulnerable to the prayers of people. That he would make his own self as a father vulnerable to people. That feels risky. What if they choose wrong? See, I'm waiting for you to be trustworthy before I trust you. And God's already saying, I'm going to give you, I'm going to trust you before you, quote, deserve it. That's a different culture in heaven than exists on earth. Man, this is exactly why Jesus gave Judas the money bag. He did not know what was going to happen. He's God. Why, I mean, why would you trust money to the guy that's going to betray you with money? seemed like the best thing to do would be like, let's remove money far from this guy so he doesn't trip up. You got it. He, Jesus believed in him. Just like we're believing in people. I heard it the other day. Somebody said it like this. You know, I, I was more changed by the people that believed in me than I was anything else in my life. Even when I didn't deserve it, even when I was acting like a, a fool, these people believed and called something out in me bigger and better than where I was presently living. That's the culture of heaven. That's what heaven's like. That's what it sounds like. That's the vocabulary of God. That's the conversations he has. If you get out of condemnation and shame and get to his face, you don't hear that other stuff. You hear, I love you. And you're like, God, I need to tell you all that. And all you're going to hear from him at first is, I love you. And he'll talk to you about whatever. Come, let's reason together. Though your sins were like scarlet, now they're white as snow. That's the conversation that heaven sounds like. Is that scripturally true? It's his truth. I'm telling you the truth right now. But to see victory, to see win, means I've got to stare some stuff down. I'm not going to be able to conquer what I'm not willing to confront. And I've got to be vulnerable. That requires vulnerability. It requires me talking to my spouse about it. It requires me talking to my family about it. It requires me talking to you, some people that I trust around me. That's what it looks like. We're not freaked out by it. We're saying we're going to get through this part of it. And in 2000, at the end of 2020, we're not staring down and facing the same things we were staring down when we started. Amen? So what are other giants? Think about the story. So when David marches out into this valley... You know the story. For 40 days, the giant has just been taunting the army of God, has been taunting God, has been sowing fear and intimidation the entire time. So here you have the, here you have the Philistines on one mountain, and you have the people of God on another mountain. And in between, you have a valley. And in this valley, get the picture, the Philistines coming down, this huge, giant enemy is coming down every day in your face, sowing fear, trying to get you to believe what he's telling you, trying to give you the report. This is the truth, sowing fear, trying to get you to believe that this is true. Every day showing up in the middle of this valley. And every day the army is getting their stuff on and no one doing anything about it. Complete complacency, complete apathy every day. What was the command? command? They already knew God was going to be with them. There wasn't a question about any of this. Like over and over it had been repeated up to this point. And what happens when one person shows up and says, you know what, uh, I'm going to stand, I'm going to take some risk, there is, there is an enemy here, I'm going to believe that God, what he said is actually true, that he is with me, and I'm going to stand here, whatever happens, and we're going to stare down this enemy that has been taunting the people of God, that's been, that's been present when this is illegal, this guy, sh he shouldn't be able to do this. This is, this is the thought life. This is the personal, private life that David has because he says it. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the army of the living God? He's full of, he's been meditating on. He's following the command of Joshua. He's been meditating. And what does he say out of his lips? Hey, we can do this. What's in it for me if we win? I love the attitude. That is a winning, that is a winning mentality. 
So he has no expectation of anything but victory. You wouldn't ask the question, what's going to happen here when, when this goes down, if you're not already expecting or at least thinking you got a chance. Amen. That's the mentality. Let me tell you the second part of this thing before we go any further about victory is we have to have a mentality because we are doing nothing for victory. It is all coming from the victory that Jesus won. Yes. Our life, the what we get to step into, the only reason we get to step into it, pray for people Give them the truth. See their life transformed. See them receive Jesus. See families restored. See bodies and health restored. The only reason we see that is because Jesus paid it all. So there's no fight for this thing. This is where we come from. So this is where David comes from. He has this mentality that, okay, what's going to be in it if we get this done today? Like, what do I get out of this thing? And I love it because it's the mentality that says, I expect that we win. When you go to pray, do you expect for it to happen? Well, then why are you praying? Why am I praying? If there's not an expectation that God is moving, that when we pray, it is, listen, you are his representation. True, he is living inside of you. And when you pray in his name, what my Bible says is, you're going to have those things that you ask. Now, do I see that every time? No. Is my mentality this, though? Yes. Is this the lens I'm supposed to be praying through? Yes. I don't care. This is what happens, though. Anytime you put yourself into a position that you say, I'm going to go for it, and you lose, or you see defeat, or you experience loss, you will begin to feel disappointment. And if you do not guard your heart, you will step away from the battle that God's called you to, and you will live in this small place that the enemy is happy to keep you in. The only place I can go with disappointment when the Patriots lose. The only place I can go with disappointment is before God. The only place I'm called to go is before God with it. Listen, to whine, to gripe, complain, and gather some more people around you, to whine and gripe and complain is to form a congregation of people that will just all of a sudden justify your unbelief and my unbelief. And all along, the standard has never changed because the commission has always been the same. That's not an easy word to swallow, but it's the truth. So we experience loss. Listen, I've, I've been there. We've all been there. You put yourself in the place that you're going to pray. You're believing God. You don't see it happen. Where do you go with that next? Are you starting to go to people? Or do you do like Jesus after the experience that he just goes all night to his father? If he experiences hard or he's about to experience torment and pain on the cross, where does he go? He just says, I'm just going to go to my father. He doesn't gather a bunch of people to gripe and complain to and then be like, oh, yeah, you're right, and all of a sudden just justify some victim mentality. He doesn't do that because he is not, he's not a victim. He, he's in victory. That is a different way to think. This is what he taught his disciples to do. That's why his disciples were completely shocked and surprised when they prayed for a demon-possessed guy and he doesn't get healed. Why? They'd been in relationship with Jesus for years and all they'd seen was wins. That's it. No losses. All of Israel experienced that until they compromised. They only experienced wins. That is it. They only experienced when the only time they lost, they had to go back to God and say, what is going on? And they figure out, oh, there's an idol. Somebody's kept something within. They can't. Well, the New Testament reality is, I can't let compromise live inside of here. There's still a standard of holiness. There's still a thing that says, that is not the way Jesus would want to see it done in my life. I've got to deal with that head on. There is still holiness. There is still a Holy Spirit. It is the spirit of holiness that raised Christ from the dead. I've got to look at it and say, God, that is not like you. You give me power. Where I am weak, you are strong. In my weakness, you are perfected. There's got to be strength to overcome to come through this. That's the truth. That's a different mentality. All the disciples knew was when. I'm like, okay, so when we experience loss, then the, the next thing happens after you gather a bunch of people around you, you, you just establish theology that says, well, that's why this happened. And now you have theology based on loss, not based on the Word of God. This is not, this is not easy. This is, the, this is the tension of the Christian life. I will still trust you. I will still not let go of the command that I'm given to see this thing happen throughout the earth. 
I mean, the very people that right after Jesus com commands them, he literally tells you, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. This is what it looks like. This is normal. I'm like, well, okay, to see that happen, that means everybody wants to see a miracle. Everybody wants to see miraculous things happen. I don't care if it's in broken relationship over here, if it's in marriage, if it's in health, if it's in finances. But what's really uncomfortable is being, uh, putting yourself in the middle of that situation, the rock and the hard place. So yeah, I can say I love. I would love to see that. We're super pumped about it. Everybody loves to hear it after it's happened. Everybody's like, yeah, sweet. It's a whole nother one to put yourself in the middle of it. It's a whole nother one to put yourself in the middle of it. If you're thinking church for the city, okay, there's turmoil. There's not unity going on over the city. There's just people saying negative things. Well, what am I doing with that? Am I putting myself before God? Owning just the sin of the place, saying, God, you've got to come and transform this river valley. Am I putting myself in that place, or am I just saying, well, that's a problem with those people? Look at that enemy. He just keeps taunting. He just keeps sowing fear. He just keeps sowing discord. And I never go stare it down in the face before God. If I don't go to that place, that's why prayer is so powerful. If I don't go to that place, I'm not putting myself in the valley. I'm not dealing with it. I'm being okay with whatever's going on. Listen, if you see fear, if you hear the intimidation, it should just be like a big red light saying, get over here right now. For with God, nothing is impossible. So the question is, when you lay down at night and you ask yourself, God, is there anything that I believe is impossible? Is there any situation that I've seen that is presently going on around me that I think is impossible? I guarantee you he'll bring a couple up. I've just been doing it this week. God, is there just things that I don't... I don't think that's even possible. I won't see change. Let me tell you, you're not full of hope at that point. Let God speak to you about it. You guys all right? You know, it's a lot. This is the word, though, for us for the year. Like, it's going to require risk. It means courage. It means you've got to take courage. It means you've got to grab a hold of some courage. Understand that the word's just true. I mean, again, the Scripture in Genesis, the question was asked, is anything too hard for God? I mean, that's a question. That was a question directed at a part. Is there anything? That's the question you ask. So when I, if I'm honest, and I lay my head down, and I say, God, is there anything that I'm just believing is just not possible for you to do? Well, I'm living under the influence of a lie because Scripture says with God, nothing is impossible. I don't want to live under that influence. I want to live under the influence of heaven. Well, to do that, it's going to require risk. It had to feel... He, it's going to feel, it always is. But listen, what happens when we deal with it? What happens when we face it down? Here's a sweet part. So when David goes and he kills the giant, we know the story. When he, when he takes, he doesn't have a sword. When he takes the enemy's sword out, he cuts Goliath's head off with Goliath's sword, right? So the very thing that he'd been taunting him with, the very thing that he'd been just putting in his face, David takes and he cuts the enemy's head off. And what happens? All of Israel just wakes up and remembers who they are. All because of one testimony of somebody that was willing to stand in that valley, in that place, and say, that's not okay. We're going to see that changed on my watch because God's assigned me to this place. And he's assigned you to some places. Some of it's with your family, not to see things happen the way it's been. Some of you are signed to even physical locations like cities. Well, I believe I, I'm here. I live in this city for a reason. You do too. You're assigned. Listen, you are still an ambassador of another kingdom sent, right? You are still an ambassador. Live like it. Talk like it. Act like it. Think like it. I still belong to a different kingdom. This home is not my home. It's not yours either. And for that to keep happening is not okay. And it's, all, it's easy to celebrate all the people that have gone before that have paid the price, but you, you, you don't know what their life looked like, the fear of man they dealt with, the loss, the hurt, the pain, the process, because there's going to be loss. You can't go out there and go for it and not experience some. You've got to think about it different. Every time you do that, every time you push, every time you pull, what's happening? You're just gaining strength. That's all you're doing. I can... I you cannot tell me that my father and your father in heaven is disappointed when you swing. 
There's no father that's not like, man, I'm praying. If faith is what pleases him, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without believing, do you not think that he's pleased when you put yourself in that place and you go for it? You're thinking, oh, we lost. He's smiling saying, I'm so glad that there's someone taking me for my very word. We've got to think about it different. We have to think about it different. If there's going to be victory, it means I've got to face down some stuff. But what are you assigned to? What are you called to? What are you called to see change personally? What are you called to see change? What are you called if you think about it? I've seen that pattern. I've watched it again. My family have watched it in my own life. I want to see breakthrough in that in this year. Then that's for you. For us, we're taking it out into the street. We're not containing this thing called church. We're not containing this one who's alive, whose name is Jesus. You're going to see it happen. But listen, when you put yourself in the valley, what are you doing when you do that? You are reconciling. It sounds like the ministry we're called to, to bring two things together. The ministry of reconciliation. That's bringing heaven to earth. That's why he prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the ministry of reconciliation. It's not a comfortable place to go stand in when everybody else wants to be over here and everyone else over here screaming at you, you can't do it. But when somebody picks up the sword and cuts off the enemy's head, what happens? Their testimony becomes our testimony. And what happens whenever you break free from alcoholism and you stand up here and you say, listen, you can be free my whole life, I experienced that. But I'm telling you, Jesus delivered me from that. What happens to the other one that's under the influence of the enemy? All of a sudden they hear the truth, the testimony of Jesus Christ, that there is freedom for the oppressed, that it's still true, that he releases captives. When they hear that, what happens? The truth hits them. And now that's possible. I can live that way. When 30 seconds earlier I was hopeless... Every time you do that, every time where what the enemy meant for evil, God turns and he uses it for good. You've got to put yourself in that place, in that valley. What is it that's staring you down? What do you need to stare down? Some of us got to get out from underneath. It's like getting, you got to quit hiding. Get out of shame and just deal with it. I'm just going to talk to you like adults. Just get out of that place where you're hiding. We love you. You are loved. You are so strong. Like, there is so much power for God for you. There is so, so much power waiting when we agree with what he says. And just step out of it. Quit hiding. You're like, yeah, I would like to do that, but I've got all these other things. You know what you need to do? You just need to step out of that. That's called shame. So I don't know what it is for you personally, but I believe God's calling this house right now. I believe that he's calling us to get rid of some compromise. And to just stare some stuff down. What have I been okay with that's not okay with him? I hate the word cancer. Hate it. Hate the word. I hate the word. Because it sows fear. It just brings all of these things into play. And I'm like, Jesus is still, he still heals people. Listen, you can argue with me all day long, but you cannot pick up your Bible and teach me out of what he said. I may not like it, I may not be living in it, but it never changes the call. I don't like it, it feels uncomfortable. It feels uncomfortable, doesn't it, to go pray for somebody. Put your hand out there and say, I just want to pray for you. What are you going to stare down? Are you going to stay over there in fear? Or are you going to step up there and say, what if? But what if? And you're always going to have two crowds of people. You're going to have the one like when David went out. You're going to have some people be like, who do you think you are? But I'm telling you, in this house, it's going to be the people like whenever uh, he was it crawled up with his armor bearer. What's his name? Who crawls up with his armor bearer? Jonathan, thank you. Jonathan is armor bearer. Let me tell you what this house is going to be. When you crawl up there and you put yourself in that place and you swing, I don't care if you win or not, we're going to be the family that stands up and says, yeah, I know you didn't get it there, but keep going, keep, keep pushing. Don't you, don't you stop because what I know to be true is your breakthrough is mine too. We are two wound together as a family. That's what I said. Pick any testimony. I don't care if you've lived with pornography for 25, 35, 45 years. The minute you confront it, the minute you hear the story of, you know what, you don't have to live with that. God will actually heal you from even that desire, that taking place over your life. Just to hear that story, to hear a testimony of somebody that came through, 
say, yeah, there's been divorce rampant through my family, but you know what? I'm going to stand up here for covenant. I'm just going to choose. Even though I don't feel like it, my emotions are telling me everything opposite. I'm going to stand here for the generations before me. Listen, it's not about perfection. It's about putting yourself back in that place. We've all missed it. We've all missed it. But I'm telling you, the place the enemy would love to keep you if you've missed it and you felt that shame or that place is to keep you over here somewhere small rather than say, you know what, I'm still called to this space. I'm telling you, the hardest fights that you've got in your life and in your family, the hardest fights you got, the most disappointment you felt when you're like, I know I did that, I'm the worst. That is your place. I'm telling you, that is your place in this year to give victory. And then it's not just to stop there, it's to tell the good news again. Let me tell you about what Jesus did for me. And watch that replicate over and over and over because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If he does it once, he's going to do it again. All right. That's enough for today. We're going to talk for the next couple of weeks on some of the rest of this, but I just want you to know, you know, even in the word 2020, the word means deliverance in Hebrew. So I, get, I just like, I like to know the word, the meaning of the numbers just something I always do. So I look it up. It means deliverance. I'm like, that sounds right. God's delivering us from here to here. Sounds right. You know where it shows up in Scripture? shows up in Esther in one verse, this word for this year. If you don't say, let me just read it to you. This, This is where taking courage and getting it out, you just have to. Let me tell you what it says. It's in Esther 4. This word for deliverance for this year shows up only one time in Scripture in this verse. For if you remain silent at this time, if you choose to shrink back, if you choose to stay over here in fear, if you remain silent in this time, of re- at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. If you don't think you're living in a timely spot, you're wrong. If you don't think God's placed you with the enemy in front of you, with whatever it is that you're staring down for a different time, you're wrong. It's for now. And guess who his name is? His name is the great deliverer. In 2020, we'll stand with you. You stand with me. I'll stand with you like we're just going to see. Well, we can't ever conquer what we're not willing to confront. Let's pray. I want you to stand if you would.